Hello everyone. I'm hoping to place more emphasis on videos which demonstrate how the Trinity violates Scripture. It directly contradicts Scripture. And there's a number of examples um, where the Trinity clearly contradicts Scripture. Up until now, I've been mainly, mainly, making videos which concern Trinitarian claims about certain verses and similar material. But now I'm, I'm going to try to shift the emphasis a little bit um, and emphasize more on how the tr doctrine of the Trinity is in direct contradiction with Scripture. I'm still going to make some of those other videos from time to time. Um, you know, as time permits and as the Lord wills. So let's just get into one very clear contradiction between the Trinity and the Bible. First, I just want to take a look here at Exodus 34. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the presence of the Lord, Yahweh, to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord, Yahweh. Exodus 34, 33-35. And you also want to take note of the previous chapter, especially verses 7-11. to and it's here where Trinitarians will claim that since no one has ever seen God the Father, Moses must have been speaking to Jesus. Okay, many of you will probably have heard that Trinitarian claim before. So they insist Moses was speaking to Jesus here. And when these passages are discussing Moses speaking with the Lord, it means Moses was speaking with Jesus. And Jesus was speaking with Moses. We're going to come back to this. I want to look at this verse here. And then we're going to look at a number of associated things um, pertaining to the idea that Paul is expressing here. 2 Corinthians 3.17, Paul says, The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Paul declares the risen Jesus, our Lord, is, is the Spirit. Now that'll never do in Trinitarian doctrine. You can't have that in Trinitarian doctrine. In the doctrine of the Trinity, Jesus is most definitely not the Spirit and cannot be the Spirit. And therefore, we're going to show that Trinity doctrine contradicts the Scriptures. The Bible says the Lord Jesus is the Spirit. Trinity doctrine, the Lord Jesus, is not the Spirit. They're diametrically opposed claims. One of them is right, one of them is wrong. Who are you going to agree with? Are you going to agree with Paul's inspired words or the doctrine of the Trinity? you got to make up your mind. You need three persons to have a Trinity. Trinity, tri, means three in one. Tri-unity. But to say Jesus is the Spirit is impossible in the doctrine of the Trinity, because this would be to say the second person of the Trinity is the third person of the Trinity. You can't do that in the doctrine of the Trinity. 
But in the doctrine of the Trinity, you can't say the second person is the third person, or you would be saying they are the same person. And you won't have three persons anymore. The doctrine of the Trinity, they're different persons. So if you're a Trinitarian and this is not clear to you, then you really don't understand the basics of your doctrine. In the doctrine of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity is not the third person of the Trinity and can't be, or you won't have three persons anymore. And if you don't have three persons, you don't have a Trinity. And the Trinity is destroyed. The Bible, the Lord Jesus is the Spirit, the Lord Jesus is not the Spirit in Trinity doctrine. So hopefully that is clear to you. You can't say Jesus is the Spirit, because that would be the same kind of thing as saying the Father is the Son. You can't say that in the doctrine of the Trinity either. The Father is not the Son in the doctrine of the Trinity. So for the same reason you can't say the Father is the Son or the Son is the Father, you can't say the second person is the third person. They're two different persons. If you say the Father is the Son, the doctrine of the Trinity disintegrates. It's over. For the same reason, you can't say Jesus is the Spirit. Now, Trinitarian academics realize they have a very serious problem here. And just reading their attempts to get out of the problem is comical, to say the least. We're going to come back to that later. First, we're going to prove beyond any doubt, any doubt whatsoever, that Paul means Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Specifically, the risen Jesus. That's implied by the context. Risen Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And the context proves it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Something you cannot say in the doctrine of the Trinity. In the doctrine of the Trinity, you have to say Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. So, when Paul says the Lord is the Spirit, if you have read Trinitarian commentaries or you've heard Trinitarian claims about this verse, they try to get out of this in various ways. They'll try to claim, in some cases, depending on the Trinitarian, that the Lord here is not Jesus. Or they'll try to claim here that the Spirit is not the Holy Spirit. And they have other claims which suggest that this verse isn't about the risen Jesus and the Holy Spirit, it's, it's about Moses in the Old Testament. We're going to see all these are false. The context shows us that all these are false and that Paul is speaking of the new ministry of the Spirit here, the Holy Spirit, that Paul tells us that the Lord in this verse is Jesus Christ and the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Whether that makes sense in your theology or not, Paul says it. The first thing is right in this very verse. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Well, it's rather obvious that the term, the Spirit of the Lord, is another one of many terms used to refer to the Holy Spirit. You know, there's all these terms that are used in the New Testament to refer to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God's Son, and the Spirit of the Lord. So we don't really even need to look any further than this verse to know that Paul is talking about the Holy Spirit. When he says, the Lord is the Spirit, he means the Lord is the Holy Spirit. And where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom the Spirit of the Lord. But there's much more 
evidence than just that. The preceding context tells us clearly that Paul has been contrasting the old ministry of the law, a ministry of death, with the new ministry of the Holy Spirit, a ministry of life. This tells us that the Spirit that he's talking about at verse 317 is the Holy Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that I have been talking about. So I've posted on this slide um, the entire preceding context, almost. I've abbreviated a little bit. As you can see, the text is going to be kind of small, but I, I wanted you to see the whole thing in its entirety so you can see this clearly. You can, you know, expand your screen to full screen or whatever, or just follow along in your Bible or just read it yourself. It's very obvious that Paul is talking about the new ministry of the Holy Spirit that believers have as a result of the outpouring of God's Spirit at Pentecost. And so Paul says here at 2 Corinthians 3, You are our letter, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Obviously, the Holy Spirit. Not on tablets of stone. Okay, he's referring to the law there. And throughout this, Context, he's going to be contrasting the old ministry of the law with the new ministry of the Spirit. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts, where the Holy Spirit indwells us. Paul says something similar in Romans 5 about the Holy Spirit being poured into our hearts. And then at verse 5, God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, new, not of the letter, the law, but of the Spirit. Not the ministry of the law, but the ministry of the Spirit. For the letter kills, Paul says something similar in Romans 7, but the Spirit gives life. He's contrasting the law, which condemned people to death, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones, the Ten Commandments, the law, came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses. He's talking about how Moses put the veil over his face. Because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? So Paul is explaining how the ministry, the new ministry of the Spirit is with much more glory than the old ministry of the law. For if the ministry of condemnation, the law, has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory, the ministry of the Spirit. For indeed what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. So the, the glory of the old pales in comparison to the glory of the new. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. The old Law versus the new ministry of the Spirit. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses. So, believers in the ministry of the Spirit, it's not like it was with Moses where he veiled his face. Who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, the Israelites of old. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, he's talking about the Jews now, in its current time, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. They have to become Christians for the veil to be removed. 
But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. So when we turn to Christ, when we turn to the Lord, the veil is lifted. Actually, I shouldn't say we, when the Jews do. Because they have this veil, um, you know, the, the gospel is veil, still veiled to them, is what Paul is arguing. So you can see he's contrasting the old ministry of the law with the new ministry of the Holy Spirit. As Paul says in Romans 8, those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. He's talking about the Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit. Abundantly clear, abundantly clear that Paul is referring to the Holy Spirit when he says, the Lord is the Spirit. Otherwise, we just have to toss away every principle of common sense hermeneutics. Basic reading comprehension has to be tossed away, actually. It's very, very clear. So we know the Spirit is the Holy Spirit in verse 317. And so Paul has been caught contrasting the old ministry of the law, a ministry of death, with the new ministry of the Holy Spirit, a ministry of life, because the Spirit gives life. And the law condemns us as sinners, or condemns the Jew under the law as sinners, as he explains in Romans 7. The context shows us beyond doubt that the Spirit at verse 317 is the Holy Spirit. Every reasonable person, I'm sure, can see that. The unreasonable, it all depends what they want to do with it, I guess. The Lord is the Holy Spirit. We know it means that now. And where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. Well, we know that's true. Where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. That's what we're taught in the New Testament. So we know Paul is talking about the Holy Spirit here in verse 317 when he says, the Lord is the Spirit. So now we know that, let's have a look at what Paul is talking about in 317 in, in general. Take a look at how Paul was talking about, you know, the whole veil thing, and how the veil is over the Jews. It's over their face, they, they're, they're, they're blinded, they can't see. But the veil is lifted in Christ. There's no chapter and verse divisions in Paul's original writings. You know, men chopped that up and added that later. And so you, when you read, you know, chapter 3 into chapter 4, you'll see that Paul is still on the same subject. He hasn't changed the subject when Paul wrote his letters, it was just like a, a long stream of letters with no paragraph indentations, no capital letters, no periods, not even any spaces. And so if you look down at chapter 4, 3, he's talking about the gospel. It's veiled. It's veiled to those who are perishing. Well, who is that? That's the Jews who have not yet turned to Christ. The same veil lies over their face. They can't see the light of the gospel because, as Paul says in verses 14 and 16, it's only when you turn to Christ, the Lord, that this veil is removed and lifted. Okay? So the context shows us very clearly that he's still talking about the same stuff in verse 4. That's important to know. In verse 317, we can also see that he is not talking about the old ministry of the law in verse 17, but he's talking about the new ministry of the Spirit, where the veil is lifted. And this is going to be important as well. Notice what he says, but, in verse 16, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. 
and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we all with unveiled face are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So he's talking about the unveiled condition of Christians. So if you're a Jewish Christian who has become, or a Jew who has become a Christian, your, the veil has been removed. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And all these Jewish Christians who were previously veiled now have been unveiled, and with unveiled face they behold the glory of the Lord. You see that? So verse 317 is absolutely referring to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's not talking about Moses and the law. He was contrasting this with Moses and the law. Now we're going to see how the context shows us beyond any doubt that the Lord at verse 317 is the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is the Holy Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord Jesus is, there is freedom. First of all, Paul tells us outright, he tells us outright what he's preaching. In verse 317, top of the page there, now the Lord is the Spirit. And then by the time we get to 4-5, he says, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. He's telling you that he's preaching Jesus as Lord. In this argument, he's making about being veiled and unveiled. You know, and how... Uh, look at 4.3. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. See how he's on the same subject. Jesus Christ is this Lord that he's preaching at 2 Corinthians 3.17. We already know, if we're understanding what Paul is saying, just by basic reading comprehension, that Paul is referring to the Lord Jesus when he says, now the Lord is the Spirit. Because he tells us. But there's more evidence that he is referring to Jesus as the Lord. Take a look at verses 14 and 16. The veil has not been removed because only in Christ is the veil taken away? Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Okay, that's the Jews. But not the Christians, the veil is taken away. But when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Compare those two verses, verses 14 and 16. Only in Christ is the veil taken away. Verse 16, when in, anyone turns to the Lord. This is basic hermeneutics. Bible interpretation. Paul is telling you here who he means by the Lord in verse 16 when he says Christ in verse 14. The veil is removed or taken away in Christ. Verse 16, when you turn to the Lord, that is Christ, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord, or Christ, is the Spirit. Verse 17. And there's more. Compare these two verses carefully. Verses 14 and 16. Very clear that Paul is referring to Jesus Christ in verse 17 when he says, The Lord is the Spirit. And compare that in its entire context. Christ, the Lord, the veil is taken away when one turns to Christ, or the Lord, depending on which verse you're reading, verse 14 or 16. He is preaching Jesus Christ as Lord. 
And here's another thing that Paul does that tells us he is referring to Jesus Christ as Lord in verse 317. Notice how he's talking about the glory of the old verses, the surpassing glory of the new ministry of the Spirit. And I won't read this. You can read this yourself if you want. But glory is on Paul's mind and the surpassing glory of the new ministry of the Spirit when one is in Christ. Compare verse 318 with verse 43. Or verse 4 4, pardon me. Notice what he says. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Who is that? Paul tells us again. So that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Again, he's talking about how the Jews who are not yet Christians can't see the gospel of the glory of Christ like the people can in verse 18, the glory of the Lord. It's Christ. Very, very obvious here. There's so much evidence that he is talking about Jesus that it's just overwhelming. The facts here are very, very decisive and forceful that he's talking about the Lord Jesus when he says, the Lord is the Spirit. One more thing. Notice verse 318. Beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. What image? The Lord is the Spirit. That image. The same image. It has to refer to something that he's talking about. What is it? We're being transformed into the same image. From glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. He's talking about the Spirit. God is Spirit. Notice what he says in 4.4, 4, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Okay? That's why Peter says at 2 Peter 1.4, we are partakers of the divine nature. Similar idea. The glory of the Lord, the glory of Christ. So there's quite a bit of information there that tells you plainly what Paul has in mind at 2 Corinthians 3.17 when he uses the term, the Lord. It's undoubtedly referring to the Lord Jesus. And he comes right out and says so. Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what I'm preaching. Very, very forceful, the facts here. It's just unavoidable. So the context forcefully demonstrates the Spirit is the Holy Spirit in this verse. The Lord is the Holy Spirit. The context also forcefully demonstrates the Lord is Jesus. More specifically, the risen Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. That's not going to work in Trinitarian doctrine. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever in, in Trinitarian doctrine. Since Jesus and the Spirit are two different persons in the Trinity, and Lord Jesus is not the Spirit in the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity contradicts Scripture, and the Trinity is thereby proven to be most certainly false. There's no doubt that Paul is saying Jesus is the Spirit here. It's unavoidable. And it directly contradicts the doctrine of the Trinity. Which one is right? You can't just leave that hanging and ignore it. It's very clear. 
And you might want to think about these verses. You know, if you're a Trinitarian, you might want to think about these verses in the context of what we're talking about. Ephesians 1.17, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And your own interpretation, if you're a Trinitarian, of 1 Corinthians 8.6. You might want to think about that very carefully. You're going to, if you think about it carefully, you're going to realize you've got some bigger problems than you thought. So, I had mentioned commentators. It, I've, I've read s- several commentaries about this verse, and it, it, it's, it's pretty amusing to read what academics do when they come to this verse. And you can tell they're trying to do all sorts of different things to get out of this, their problem. Because they can't have it that Scripture says the second person of the Trinity is the third. They can't have it. Because it destroys the Trinity. And so they try, they try all kinds of things. And, you know, just, just watching them, you know, Trying all these uh, maneuvers to get out of the problem um, just tells you something right on the face of it, if you think about it. One of the things that some of them try, and they all try different things, is to switch it around and have it say, the Spirit is the Lord, instead of having it say, the Lord is the Spirit. So they kind of switch around what Paul is saying there, and so they have Paul saying, No, the Spirit is the Lord. And that's because in their own head, and it's hard to understand this if you're not a Trinitarian, or if you never have been, that saying the Spirit is the Lord sounds better in their head than saying the Lord is the Spirit. It's kind of like it it sounds better in their, their head to say Jesus is God than to say God is Jesus. That doesn't sound as good to them, and there's reasons for that. However, this isn't going to work either, because it doesn't matter if you say the second person of the Trinity is the third person of the Trinity, or the third person of the Trinity is the second person of the Trinity. It's not going to work. you got the exact same problem, the exact same predicament. So a second thing that a lot of them will try is to try to rework what Paul meant by the Spirit. And I don't even want to get into all the contraptions they come up with here. Because it, it's just so weird. Um, you, you can read about that yourself. Um, they'll try things like, well, he's talking about the Spirit of the Gospel in verse 317. And they're, and they're trying to suggest Paul is not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's got some other idea going on. He's talking about preaching, you know, in the spirit of the gospel or some weird thing like that. And they're coming up with these things out of thin air. Um, That's not going to work. We have seen that Paul is talking about the Holy Spirit beyond any doubt. The verse itself tells us he's talking about the Holy Spirit. One of the more favorite ones... And this is the funniest one. And you'll see this one quite commonly. Is to try to define the Lord as the Lord in caps, meaning Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, And the Lord in question is the Lord that was speaking to Moses. And that's why Moses had to put this veil on his face. Okay? So you can see why they want to claim that, because Paul has been talking about um, Moses having this veil on his face under the law. Problem is, Paul isn't talking about Moses under the law in verse 17. He's talking about the new ministry of the Spirit in Christianity. So that's the first problem. And the problem's for this claim, just get bigger and bigger. 
for the Trinitarian. And so one of the verses they like to cite the most is verse Exodus 34, 34. We'll just read that quickly here. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. Well, that's what Paul was talking about at 2 Corinthians 3, right? So they can make this sound pretty good, they think. Verse 34, but when he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Exodus 34, 33 to 35. And you can go back to Exodus 33, 7 to 11 and read that, because the story really kind of starts back there with the Trinitarian claim. Well, so they say the Lord of 2 Corinthians 3, 17 is this Lord. Right? And they think that's going to get them out of their problem. But it doesn't get them out of their problem. What are they saying? When they're trying to say the Lord is the Spirit means Yahweh. Is, are they trying to say the triune God is the Holy Spirit? That's not going to work. That's not true. Even in their own doctrine, that's not true. Are they trying to say the Father is the Holy Spirit? Well, that's not going to work any better than saying Jesus is the Holy Spirit. You see how that claim doesn't even work? It fools a lot of people, but it doesn't even work. Because there's nobody they can pick that will make sense here. They can't even say the Spirit is the Spirit. I mean, that's just ridiculous that you have Paul needing to tell people, well, you know, the Spirit is the Spirit. The third person is the third person. It's goofy. So nothing works here for the Trinitarian. You see what they're trying to do by saying, well, that just means Jehovah is the Spirit or Yahweh is the Spirit. They're just trying to muddy the waters and hope you'll kind of think, well, it's kind of vague then. We're not sure. Well, it doesn't matter which identity you pick, the triune being, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Nothing is going to make any sense. Nothing. So this claim's not going to work. Here's the funniest part. This is just, I don't know, funny. Before we get to that, notice that Paul is not talking about Moses and Jehovah. Notice verse 13. We are not like Moses, but to this day whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. He's not talking about Moses and the law in verse 17. Very, very clear. He's talking about the new ministry of the Spirit. The new ministry of the Spirit. Remember that first slide I put up when we started this video? Where Trinitarians claim that Moses was speaking to Jesus here. Right? No one has ever seen God the Father. Therefore, at Exodus 33 to 34, Moses was speaking to Jesus. Jesus. It was Jesus. It wasn't the Father. It wasn't the triune being. It was Jesus that Moses was speaking to. That's their claim. Their claim. So on Monday... You can have a Trinitarian tell you that the Lord who spoke to Moses at Exodus 33 to 34 is Jesus. And then on Tuesday, when you're talking about 2 Corinthians 3.17, they'll claim the Lord of that verse is not Jesus, 
But the Lord, who spoke to Moses at Exodus 33-34, which on Monday they said was Jesus. See how they're caught in their own lies? They not only contradict Scripture, they're willing to lie like this to get away from Scripture. You can tell how much they care about Scripture, can't you? When you see this sort of thing. They don't care. They'll do anything to nullify Scripture when it does not suit their doctrine. Because they love their doctrine more than the truth of God. It's undeniable for reasonable people and honest people that Paul said Jesus is the Holy Spirit, the risen Jesus. He is speaking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and tells us outright that he is preaching Jesus Christ as Lord. The evidence is decisive, it's forceful. You know, it's, it's about as forceful as it's ever going to get in Bible interpretation. That the Lord of this passage is Jesus Christ. And the same with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, or the Spirit, Paul mentions, is the Holy Spirit. And the fact that he's talking about the new ministry of the Spirit in this verse is unavoidable. Trinitarian contrivances to try to get out of their contradiction with the Scripture only puts them in another contradiction. They've got no escape. They're caught. They're caught with their hand in the cookie jar. So let's just quickly, I just want to quickly show you some things here related to this. The risen Jesus is the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul is saying. If you think about it, we know Christ dwells in us. How else could Christ dwell in us? Right? Think about that. The Lord is the Spirit. And I'm going to put Spirit in all caps here. You'll see why in a minute. Look at what he says at 1 Corinthians 15.45. Paul is explaining what the resurrection body is like. And he says it's like this. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last, Adam, life-giving spirit. He's using Jesus as an example of what our resurrection body will be like. Such that he can call it life-giving spirit, a spiritual body. Paul is saying this in reference to Jesus Christ's bodily resurrection. Bodily. Paul, Paul is calling that crucified body which was resurrected into glory life-giving spirit and that's because we're told he was clothed and consumed in the spirit of God in his resurrection the two became one spirit and his body a new creation and that's why Paul also says this therefore from now on we know no one according to the flesh Remember he says in 1 Corinthians 15, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God. Therefore, from now on, we know no one according to the flesh, though we have known Christ according to the flesh, but now we know him thus. No longer. No longer. The risen Christ is life-giving spirit. And that is being said about his bodily Resurrection. I hope I don't have to repeat that. Look at this. In John 20, Peace be with you, just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. This is the risen Jesus. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. How could he do that if in fact... Unless or unless he was that spirit. Remember the doors were locked shut and he just appeared to them? Out of nowhere. 
How could you do that unless you're spirit? Not a phantom like a ghost. He explains that in Luke 24. But his bodily resurrection, he's got a different kind of body, a new creation, a new kind of humanity. A new kind of humanity, this body. Look at John 14. I'll ask the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may be with you forever. That is, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. What did he just start off by saying? What was he saying here? I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter. Okay, He's telling them they're going to receive the Spirit. And then he says, I will come to you in the same breath. Think about this. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you after a little while the world will no longer see me. But you will see me, as they did in the upper room. Because I live, resurrected, you will live also. In that day, once he's rose again from the dead, you will know I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Thomas knew that at John twenty twenty eight. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. In that day, what happened in that day? He meets them in the upper room, breathes on them, and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. See that? The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last, Adam, life-giving spirit. That's why we have resurrection life in Jesus Christ, in the risen Christ. The spirit is life. And that's the whole idea, the body of Christ. That's where there's life, because his body is clothed in the Holy Spirit of life. And that's why we no longer know him according to flesh. Flesh is just immortal or, pardon me, mortal humanity. Jesus is immortal, clothed in the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the living God. And that's why he says at 2 Corinthians 3, 6-17, The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The Lord is the Spirit. That's why life is found in Jesus. That's why He is that. It's also interesting to compare this. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last, Adam, life-giving spirit. And here's what he says about you if you follow Jesus. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, the mortal Adam state, we will also bear the image of the heavenly, the risen Jesus. We have the same image. And what was he talking about at 2 Corinthians 3? Now the Lord is the Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding, in the, glo beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. From glory unto glory. Just as from the Lord, the Spirit. First man, Adam, a living soul. The last man, the last Adam, life-giving Spirit. Just as we have borne the image of the first Adam, we're going to bear the image of the risen second Adam. Life-giving Spirit. He's talking about the same thing in 2 Corinthians 3. Same idea. Here's... A couple of more things, and then we'll wrap this up. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Romans 8. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells, where? In you. But if anyone does not have, so you have the Spirit in you, you have it, the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. If Christ is in you, think about what he just said there. If the Spirit of Christ is in you, Christ is in you. 
That's not true in Trinitarian doctrine, because Christ is not the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ in Trinitarian doctrine is the Holy Spirit. The second person is not the third person. But Paul is saying here, if the Spirit of Christ is in you, Christ is in you. And notice how that is also called the Spirit of God. Why is that? Because that Spirit in which he was clothed in his resurrection is the Spirit of his God and Father. Same Spirit. Same Holy Spirit. God's Spirit. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is life. He was raised life-giving Spirit because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, who's that? The Father. So now it's being called the Spirit of the Father. The Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of Christ, same thing, yes. Christ received that Spirit bodily when he rose from the dead. See Acts 2.33 and 36, where it says that about Jesus, the risen Jesus, and how God made him Lord. But if the Spirit of him, the Father who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit, the Father's Spirit, that dwells in you. See how that, if the Spirit dwells in you, that is Christ in you. Because the Lord is that Spirit. He is that now. Just like the Father is Spirit. And Jesus inherited that Spirit in his resurrection. Notice this. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God says this. So this is Jesus instructing John what to write to the seven churches. And he says, The Son of God says this. Remember when Jesus appeared to John in chapter 1 of Revelation? He says, I am the first and last. I was dead. Behold, I am alive evermore. And so it's Jesus speaking to John and telling him what to write to the seven churches. So he says, the Son of God says this. Then he gives the message for the Thyatira church. And then he finishes by saying, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Same thing happens for all seven churches. Starts off where Jesus says, I'm saying this. And then he finishes by saying, he was near to let him hear what the Spirit says. So who said it? But if we just take this for what it says, this message came from Jesus. Jesus tells us, and then Jesus is saying, this message comes from the Spirit. Jesus says, I'm speaking. And then he says, the Spirit is speaking. That's not going to work for Trinity doctrine. Jesus is the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. Paul said so, quite plainly. The Trinity contradicts the Bible. Verdict, the Trinity is certainly false. Scripture checkmates the Trinity. This is just but one example of many. God bless you.